a uh, chapter Romans chapter 13 talks a lot about obeying the government basically I'm just putting that in a big nutshell and I'm going to go through some of the scriptures uh, initially but what I'd really like for everyone to do is to you know express your opinion on what all is going on right now um, we've we've got we see a lot of federal government control we see a lot of state government control we hopefully are seeing these governments make these rules in order to protect us hopefully that's what's going on uh, I've got friends that think the whole thing is a big hoax I've got friends that that, that that think you know uh, the government's allowing too much freedom and needs to shut down uh, more things that we're getting uh, uh, back in the swing of things too fast and you know we all hope you know I hope everybody will 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 join in and do, let's just express our opinions when the time comes and uh, uh, but but this particular Romans 13 study has hit at a very interesting time. So, um, all right, well, chapter 12 exhorted the believer to perform duties related to their gifts and their calling. It talked a lot about our gifts and, and uh, that, that we shouldn't just let them lay there, that, that we should, we should uh, act, be active with our Yes, well, chapter 13 talks about our responsibility of being citizens and our responsibility to our fellow man. So uh, let, let's just kind of jump in and, and, and I'll, uh, uh, I'll bring up a, a point here in a few minutes where we can express our opinion on, on what's, what's going on. Let me move this out of the way. So feel free to jump in anytime. Sort of, sort of like the way that, that you should vote, early and often. A little, little humor there. Romans 13, 1, let everyone be subject to the higher powers. Okay, well, we know who the higher power is. And it goes on and says, because there's no power but God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And I know we we can we can really get uh, uh, real specific about that statement. The powers that are ordained of God. That that means that that God's up there with uh, puppet strings, as I as I say occasionally directing us to vote a certain way so that uh, certain people who fulfill his plan are in certain positions. And, you know, I don't go anywhere near that far, but I, I know people that, that, that do. Uh, so as a general rule, the powers that be are ordained of God. Now, Christians have the duty of civil, civil, obedience not civil disobedience but civil obedience disobedience to government authority is based on this and some other scriptures is disobedience to god it will be judged as it as it will say a little bit later the believer us united to christ must still obey the laws of the state if you go out go 100 miles an hour in most states, uh, and and you get pulled over, it's going to be very expensive. You have broken the law. The Christian is a member of a spiritual institution, the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. And I, I'm, I'm sure we all understand that a church is not a building. It's the people. It's people, God's church, or the church of God, are people who God has given his Holy Spirit to, that he's called, and have that spirit of God dwelling in them. 
And, and as I've said many times, and I'm sure you all look at it the same way, you know, may the force be with you from Star Wars. We have the most powerful force in the universe dwelling inside of us, the Holy Spirit that God has given us. So the, the church, if you will, the church of God is a spiritual institution, but the state is a secular institution, two totally different things. Believers should rarely reject governmental authority. That doesn't mean never, but rarely, and only in uh, extreme cases. Now, this is Skip's opinion. We are not to be terrorists or anarchists, I don't believe. However, if a government opposes God's law or passes a law that opposes God's law or one of God's laws, then we must obey God rather than men. As it says, if I could get my clicker work, it says in Acts 5.29, then Peter and the other apostles, when they were told, uh, you know, okay, it's time, you all, it's time for you all to shut up about this. This Jesus guy is dead and gone. You're going to have to quit preaching about him. And then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, huh, we ought to obey God rather than men. So uh, it, it seems like what he tells us in this chapter, and we're not all the way through yet, obviously, unless the governmental authority opposes God's law, then Christians should submit to it. Even though the men who administer the authority are ungodly and wicked, and that's the tough part, we know that a lot of our leaders are certainly ungodly. We know that they are wicked. It, it's amazing to me how somebody can go to Congress and make $200,000 a year, and 10 years later, they're multimillionaires. I, th that one I hadn't figured out yet. I'm being facetious. Of course, I know exactly where that's coming from. Uh, and, and that includes men such as Hitler, Stalin, and hundreds of other despots who have ruled nations down through the millennia. But we aren't to blindly follow them. My clicker keeps not working. Uh, Here's an early example of what God intended man's rulership to be like. Then God said, and this is in Genesis 1, obviously, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And, and by the way, I'm going to throw something in here. Maybe I shouldn't, but I'm going to. Uh, according to our likeness, male and female, he created them. If there were 47 different sexes, he would have created 47 different people, but he only created two, male and female. But anyway, that's a whole other whole uh, issue. But let, let us make man in our own image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky. In other words, man is to be over the earth, over every living thing on the earth. And that includes trees and, you know, plants and crops and, and fish and cows and, and other men and, and so on. And in verse 28, it says, God blessed them. Now that would be Adam and Eve. And God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God told Adam that all animals were subject to him. And this is at the very, very beginning, of course, but he said the same thing about Christians being subject to higher powers that we read in verse one. Now, did, did God want Adam to beat and torture and murder every animal that displeased him? 
were animals to be fearful of Adam and cower down every time he came into their sight? Of course not. And he doesn't want those kind of actions from other human leaders. He does not want human leaders to beat, to jail for no reason, and to murder. Because we know that Stalin and Hitler and uh, some, of the, uh, some of the leaders of some of the African nations, and I'm sure other nations, these are just some that pop into my head right now, they have killed millions and millions and millions of people. It's my understanding that Stalin killed more people during World War II than Hitler did. Now, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, think, that, I think that's right. So w when we're subject to the powers that be, then the powers that be have a responsibility to treat us with respect and kindness. And uh, Diane and I had an experience, more Diane than me, we were on our way to a, a basketball tournament one, one year at, uh, uh, in San Antonio and got pulled over. She did, she was driving in Texas and she was treated like a dog by this officer that thought she was some wanted in Colorado, a lady with the same name and the same birthday. And uh, she got put in the, in the uh, canine car and hauled down to the jail, and it took us about three hours to get out of there before we could convince them that she is not from Colorado Springs. I mean, it was a miserable experience for Diane. Uh, but the leaders have a responsibility to not be cruel to the people that they have authority over. That is what we're subject to. A Christian is to follow the instructions of the state so long as this obedience does not con conflict with God's will or Christ's authority. So let's look at verses one and two again. Let every one, every life be subject to the pow higher powers for there's no power but of God. Verse two, whoever therefore resists the power, anarchy, terrorism, resist the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves judgment. Interesting. Now, I really think in this case, Paul is talking about human justice. If you resist, if you get pulled over for speeding, and uh, you, know, you, you fight with the officer, you're gonna get arrested you're going to get thrown in jail for res resisting arrest and no telling what else. So th there's the judgment or a type of judgment that we would get if we resist, resist the ordinance of, of, of man. Um, we must obey the laws of the land, and if we don't, we're subject to judgment, fines, jail time, even death. But innocent people, unarmed people, we've had a situation recently, and, and, I, and, and I've, I've heard two sides of this thing, but it, it looks like these, these two guys just uh, murdered a guy. That's what it looks like, but there may be a, a different side of that. But that's, that's my point. That kind of stuff should not happen. So here are a few companion verses. Um, first, oh, yeah, here's, this, this is kind of where I was going to open it up. This is the Holocaust. This is a picture of hundreds of Jews and, and uh, maybe uh, homosexuals and gypsies being loaded onto railroad cars to be taken to death camp. And I know some people, and you all probably do too, who believe that's exactly what we are submitting to by not being allowed to go in restaurants, to go in businesses. To, we have to wear masks. We have to wear gloves, etc. So anybody got any opinions on, not, not necessarily this picture here, but 
what, what we've been seeing for the past two months. I know Michael was planning on being here. I'm not sure. Michael's here. I'm just oh, on. There you. I'm are. on my phone. On my phone, not on my computer tonight because I'm upstairs. Uh, what was your question in terms of what we've seen the last couple months? Yeah, you know, uh, is you know, is the government overstepping? Uh, is this you know, do they have a right to to pass laws or or requirements in order to protect? us as as citizens and 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 so on and every, everybody's welcome to jump in on this yeah, well my my particular position on on this it it, it it's varied I, I obviously as you mentioned earlier our, our government is not one well i, I wrote you earlier our, our government in my opinion is completely lawless um and I mean, they've demonstrated that time and time again, and they're a lawless, you know, when you have a, a, a corrupt institution or corrupt, it, corrupted institutions, you, you don't have any sense of justice. Um, but as far as a pandemic like what we're going through, um, you know, when it comes to uh, public health and safety, that a government upholding God's laws would be um, making sure that people that are, that don't have other people's best intentions at heart and only thinking about their own enjoyments, their own selfishness, government then by imposing uh, limitations on uh, public contact during uh, an epidemic, that is a lawful legal action that actually upholds uh, what God would want a Christian people uh, to be subject to. Um, at the same time I say that, you know, human nature is one that it will never let a crisis go to waste. So you're going to have people that want to become little mini Hitlers and little mini Pol Pots and Stalins decide to see how far that they can subjugate a free people by using the pretext of the pandemic to uh, impose all kinds of things above and beyond, uh, you know, the, the scope of their authority in order to, you know, to subjugate the, their people and make all kinds of onerous decrees and, uh, you know, churches can't open, but, uh, you know, this, this establishment can and this this one can. I think that's you're trying to find a balance between all of it is almost an individual uh, base uh, situation. What's going on in New York and, and uh, where Eric is in um, New Jersey is vastly different than what it is, say, in Odessa, Texas, where the population is a lot less and people are spread out further. Um, but, you know, we no longer have a people that use common sense. And when you have a people that are only uh, following their their own selfishness, then Everyone looks to government to impose some kind of of, of, of uh, law and rule. The only problem is, is that they're getting, they might take it too far. So anyway, that's my thought on that. Okay. Anybody else? Um, yeah, I'd like to to weigh in a little bit. <clears throat> I think that the idea of uh, you know the way it works, I, I feel like, is it's a lot of it is modeled after. Um, <laughs> Uh, the Old Testament, how case law was kind of the the, the, the standard that was set before is how you honor it uh, moving forward. New laws come into existence. And if we are a, uh, a Christian nation, a Judeo-Christian nation, uh, we, we do have roots in um, the Bible, right? Um, and I think there's a process that God laid out for Moses um, to govern the people when it was too much, right? Um, kind of giving him the the lines of how this is supposed to be uh, for judges, over 10, 100, even 1,000, and that way um, they can have some things figured out that are that are nebulous, a little bit hard to figure out. I think we're in one of those situations right now where it's a little hard to figure out, um, and I think it's left up to us to to voice our opinion. Um, and, and so I think that there is uh, a lot of things that fall into that category, and one of them was abortion for me. Um, where I feel like it's um, there, they are, you know, not representing the will of the people um, or, or the majority of the people. And you know, I think it's on it's on us to to speak up. I'm a big per I'm a big believer in that we're not a not to not be a victim. Um, you know, God is Almighty and wonderful and has given us life, and um, to to celebrate that through uh, being being vocal and also being gentle with everyone as much as possible but uh, what's going on right now is i feel like 
it's um uh, gosh we're gonna get political um i think there's some people taking advantage of the situation they're politicizing it and i think that there was some some reasonable measures that were trying to be uh instituted that uh, did not have nefarious um intentions but i think there are some leaders who have used to defame uh, our president and have uh you know that's unfortunate um, but i'll leave it there yeah i'm sure all of us know someone who believes this whole thing is a sham that there's uh there, there's no reason for any it was just it was just to uh to, to bring to bring down uh trump i you know uh, I'm not a conspiracy theorist guy. I've got a real good friend that is, and he keeps sending me videos and things to watch. And uh, I just, you know, I just don't, I just don't watch them. There's, there's, we all know there's, there's at least two sides to, uh, to everything. Somebody, I read one time, somebody said that there's three sides. There's your side, my side, and the right side. And, you know, I, I, I kind of come down in the middle of this thing and it may not be as bad as what they are telling me, but why should I take that that chance? So when Diane and I go somewhere, we wear masks and, and gloves and the, the mask may be useless, but I feel more comfortable wearing a mask and glove. But I, you know, I don't force that on anybody else. I don't, I don't make, you know, I don't go in handing out uh, gloves and masks. I know there's been people shot for not, or at least I've read that they were, uh, that there's been people shot because they weren't wearing a mask, uh, which is kind of ridiculous. So anyway, uh, we don't know, but we are told to obey the laws of the land, as long as they don't conflict, conflict with with God's law. So, uh, you know, I guess I, I would say I'd leave it there, but there's a lot more about this in chapter chapter 13. Um, in in Second Tim in First Timothy two, it says, you know, I, I exhort you. Uh, you know, I'm I'm warning you. Got, I'm I'm Please, you know, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority. We are supposed to pray for them. It doesn't matter how much we hate the president or the governor or the local mayor or, or whoever. It doesn't matter. God says we're supposed to pray for them, them who are in authority, especially if they seem to be godless, if they are not believers. I'm adding that. That's not what the scripture says, but that, but I think it's even more important if, if they're not. But we're supposed to pray for kings and for all that are in authority. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. Think about that. Uh, in Germany, World War II, had everybody prayed and had God listened, or or you know it, it was within His plan, He could He He, he would have stopped all of, all of that. And that, that may be a bad example, but anyway, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So we'll be left alone. Let's pray for our leaders so that they will learn and they will lead in a godly manner. Verse three, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. We are to pray for our leaders, no matter how hard it is. In Titus, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. Obey magistrates. Be ready to every good work. Speak evil of no man. Don't be a fighter, brawler. Be gentle. Show all meekness to all 
men. The entire third chapter of the letter that Paul wrote to Titus tells us that we should have good works. Now remember, the, the good works aren't going to, they're not salvation, but we should have good works. And then he, he continues, Titus, uh, Paul continues uh, in his letter to Titus, um, speak evil of no man. I, I read that. For we ourselves, and, and this is, this is one of the things. We should not be hypocrites. We used to be just like them. For we ourselves were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving different lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Didn't we, weren't we like that or some of those things? before God called us, before we received God's Holy Spirit? I certainly was. Matter of fact, I was kind of bad about some of those things afterwards. Uh, Paul encourages us to be good examples to others. Not how we were before conversion, and that includes the obeying of the laws of the land. In 1 Peter, Peter says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or the president or the governor or the, the mayor or the police officer that pulls you over or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. God knew that over time his people would drift away from him. You know, if, if he didn't know that, why did he set up protections? The biggest protection would be to send his son to shed his blood to pay for our sins. If God didn't know that we weren't going to need a savior, he wouldn't have set up his plan to send his son. That's pretty simple. Uh, God established a theocracy in Israel, and a theocracy is a government of priests, a government of religious leaders, if you will. Uh, but he knew that only a few, a remnant, as he talks about uh, earlier in, uh, I think, Romans uh, 9 or 10, I can't remember, would continue to obey him. So he also set up a secular system that would help man to obey the commandments pertaining to our treatment of our fellow man. And we'll see that discussed a little bit later in this, in this chapter. He, he speaks in verse 15. He, he alludes to letting our light shine. For such is the will of God that by doing right, doing good deeds, being nice, Loving your neighbor, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Let your lights shine. Uh, what's the what's the cliche? Uh, it's better to preach a sermon by your life than it is with your mouth. And that's not exactly the way it goes, but if you think about it, you know that that works. It's it's true. People see you. Uh, Romans 13, 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil works. Will, will you then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and you shall have praise of the same. Now, there are exceptions to that, and we all know that. And uh, let's see, what's the, what's the uh, cliche? Uh, no good deed goes unpunished. You know, <clears throat> for he is the servant, the minister of God to you for good. But if you do that which is evil, be afraid. For he bears not the sword in vain. God has allowed or put people in charge that have 
the sword that they can punish. For he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that does evil. Now, here's the same thing in the complete, that's King James Version. Here's the same thing in the complete Jewish Bible, which I really like. For rulers are no terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you like to be unafraid of the person in authority? Then just do what's good, and you'll win his approval. Again, there are exceptions to that because we, you know, every ruler is not, or every policeman and, and so on is, is not godly, but we need to be unafraid of the person in authority. And we do that by being good. If you get pulled over, be polite. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Uh, don't fight. Don't argue. I wasn't speeding. What'd you pull me over for? Verse four, for he is God's servant there. Why? For your benefit. But if you do what's wrong, be afraid. Because it's not for nothing that he holds the power of the sword. For he is God's servant, there as an avenger to punish wrongdoers. I think that uh, this uh, translation is, is really, really, really makes it clear. Now, Paul, when he's writing this, is under the authority of the Roman government. And he's speaking to Christians who are also under the authority of the Roman government. But, but he's also speaking to Christians who will come later. He doesn't know this, but we do. He's speaking to us. He writes under the assumption that leaders are serving the people. And I, I think that's a good assumption that we can make, and uh, it's, it's, it's many times not true, but, you know, let's, let's assume that they are serving the people until they prove that they're not. If you follow the law, you should have nothing to fear. On the other hand, if you break the law, you should be afraid. Pretty simple. Verse five, wherefore, you must be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. We, we should obey the law not be, not just because we're afraid of what's going to happen to us if we don't, but because it's the right thing to do. You know, God God tells us that he wrote his law on our hearts. And what he means by that is that it's natural for us to obey God's law. It's not something that we have to stop and think about. You don't have to stop and think, oh, wait a minute, eh, I don't know, maybe I should steal that. Nah, maybe, well, I don't know, maybe, should I steal it or should I? You know, we, we shouldn't have to stop and think about it. We obey. And uh, moving on, verse six, for this cause you pay tribute, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. They're supposed to serve. It's their job. Render, therefore, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear or respect to whom respect is due, and honor to whom honor is due. Now, in verse 4, where you see the word minister. Uh, oh, that's a complete Jewish Bible. Uh, in verse four, at the beginning, for he is minister, that's diakonos, it means servant, serve, as Michael Deering so well puts, we wash each other's feet. For he is the foot washer of God, serves others. And then uh, the same thing is for he is the minister, diakonos of God, servant. We have a job. 
So, and that is the correct translation. However, in verse six, the word minister, ministers, is a different word. It's a different Greek word. It's liturgos. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right, but anyway, it's a term which describes governmental authorities as public workers. The word was used in Greek literature to describe a man or a woman who performed some public service at their own expense. I'm going to read that again. At their own expense. Think about our government. Think about how much money is given to our governmental officials, congressmen, senators, and so on by lobbyists. Their salary is, I don't know, $200,000 a year, whatever. But they walk out of the Senate or the House 15 or 20 years later as multimillionaires making $200,000 a year. Now that's a lot of money, but there's a it's a long way from two hundred thousand dollars times ten, which is two million dollars, and walking out as having having kept ten million dollars. You know, it, it it's it's logical that the two hundred thousand dollar salary that they get is pretty much spent. A lot of them have two households. You know, one back in uh, wherever, Maryland, and one in Washington. So, uh, yeah, it may take them a little bit more money to live on than it, than it does us, but not $10 million, folks. So anyway, uh, these government officials were supposed to serve, I'm not going to say at their own expense, but they weren't supposed to become multimillionaires. Uh, this, this Greek word means a public servant or an administrator. Now, uh, in, in this uh, pay tribute to whom tributes do, custom to custom, Paul is, is saying that we should pay our taxes or tribute to the leaders in theory so they can use the money for public good, in theory. I don't think he had lobbyists in mind when Paul wrote that. Now in, in verse eight, Paul shifts from our responsibility to the leaders of the land to talking about loving one another, how to treat our neighbors. And, and then when we get to verses nine and 10, he, he tells us how. So he, he says in verse eight, he writes, owe no man anything except for this, love one another. For he that loves another has fulfilled the law. You know, uh, Christ said, and this is this is a quote from the Old Testament too. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In these two are the whole law. Well, I think most of us know if you take the Ten Commandments and you take the first four commandments. That's loving God. The first four commandments tell us how to love God, not to have graven images, not to have a, a God in front, a little G God in front of the, the big G God, the real God. Um, honor him by observing the day that he set up at, at creation, a day to rest. It's, it's really interesting that he tells us, here's one of the ways that, you are to obey me and worship me, but guess what? I'm giving you a day off. You don't have to work seven days a week like you did in Egypt. And we have so much stress in this nation, in this world, so much hatred. A day off would be a pretty good thing. And you know, those many, most of us on this on this call believe that he not only did he give us that day off, but he told us which day it was, and he he planned on all of us keeping the same day. But anyway, that's a whole other whole other issue. Talks about Paul talks about love fulfilling the law. 
And in verse 9, he mentions five of the last six commandments. And then he summarizes them. So he says for this, don't commit adultery. There's one. Don't kill. Two. Don't steal. Three. Don't bear false witness. Four. And that doesn't just mean lying. That means not giving out a false story. That You know, going to court, uh, lying about your neighbor or telling a false story about your neighbor. Anyway, thou shalt not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it's briefly comprehended in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You know, he, he names most of the, the five of the six of the last of the Ten Commandments and, and says, here it is in a nutshell. I'm summarizing those five laws in one. Love your neighbor as yourself. There again, the law is written in our hearts, okay? So if the law is written in our hearts, we're not going to commit adultery. We're not going to kill. We're not going to steal. We're not going to bear false witness and so on because it's a part of us. And as, as a friend of mine who's, who's on here right now talks about religion and relationships, and, and he's absolutely right. God wants us to have a relationship with him, and he wants us to have a relationship with our fellow man. Love your neighbor as yourself. All right, let's see. If you treat your fellow man with love and respect, you have fulfilled the last six commandments. Now, you didn't do away with them, but you fulfilled them. You filled them to the brim. You filled the boat with water. Uh, that's what this 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 word fulfill means. Fill it up. Verse ten. Love does not work ill to his neighbor. Hello. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So, if you love your neighbor, have you done away with the law? No. You are keeping the law and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep wake up sleepyhead for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed is it not i mean are we not seeing some crazy stuff right now that could be a harbinger i think is the right word for things to come uh, and you know what I don't think we're taking it very well. Just my personal opinion. But what are we going to do when the things we read about in John's book that Christ revealed to him called Revelation? What are we going to do when all that stuff happens? So verse 11 is a warning to all Christians. We don't know how long we have. We, every one of us could die tonight. We're mortal. We're subject to time and chance. Paul says it's time to wake up. Christ's return is nearer than when we first believed. And, and for many of us on here, that's true because we first believed 40, 45, 50 years ago. Some of you are not that old. Verse 12, the night is far spent the day is at hand let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light what is the best disinfectant light transparency let people see what really happened and you look at what's going on in washington dc right now and it just makes you sick because, you know, the, 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 the liars are lying to the liars. And you can't believe anything that anybody says. I don't care which side of the center you're on, whether you're on the right side. I don't mean that as correct. Whether you're conservative 
or whether you're liberal, it doesn't matter. They're all a bunch of liars. And there may be a little bitty piece of truth in what they say, but I hate to say it, and you all know it, but they're going to tell you what is going to help them the most. Not what's going to help you the most, but what's going to help them the most. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul told them to look to God who will help us battle the works of the devil. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the desert, de desert devil. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness and chambering and wantonness, not in strife or envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill, fulfill the lusts thereof. Let that sink in for a minute. Back in Romans 13, the night is almost gone. The day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness. You know, everybody's mother told them nothing good happens after midnight. I've heard that a thousand times. My mother used to say it. Skip, you need to be home. Nothing good happens after midnight. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now, so you're, you're at, if you lived in Pocahontas, you were at the Tasty Freeze and everybody's circling the Tasty Freeze. And there was, there were a few spotlights here and there, floodlights here and there, but basically it was dark. And so lots of stuff happened out there that would not have happened if they had football field lights or baseball field lights shining down on all of our cars. Let us behave properly, verse 13, as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness or sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. The last four verses of this chapter list eight commands for Christians. We're not there yet. One, cast off the works of darkness. Well, wait a minute. Maybe these are the last four. Yeah, I don't think they are. Uh, cast off the works of darkness. Put on the armor of light. Live honorably. Stop rioting and drinking. Shun all immoral living. Refrain from quarrels, contentions, and jealousies. Clothe oneself with the character of Jesus Christ. Make no provision for lust. You know, what is the character of Jesus Christ? Paul has told us several times in his letters, as we, as we read all of his letters, and, and we have, this, uh, we're, uh, I don't know if this is the last one. I don't remember what order we've done this study in, but he says, love everyone like Christ loved you. How did Christ love us? He died for us. Verse 12 puts, tells us to put on the armor of light. And, and by the way, the Greek word translated armor means weapon, put on the weapon of Christ. In John 18, 3, we see that word used. The very last word is the Greek word that was translated armor over here. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Same Greek word that was translated armor. Paul says to lay aside the deeds of darkness. 
and put on the weapon of light. People should see Christ in us. How many times, especially politically, have you heard this phrase? And I said it a few minutes ago. The best disinfectant is light, is transparency. That's what Paul is telling us. Just think how different many people, how differently many people conduct themselves between the day and the night. As they say, it's night and day, pun intended. And here's here are the last three verses again. They're 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 self-explanatory. And we've already talked about them. The night is almost gone; the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, like we do in the daytime. You know. <clears throat> Bank robberies generally happen at night. Well, that's not maybe, maybe that's a bad example. They go in and they hit up a teller. Um, but you get my point. A lot of things happen at night that would not happen during the daytime. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ character and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. If we have Christ in us, we don't need to worry about fleshly sins because God's Holy Spirit, Christ in us, will help us to fight those things. Okay, that's, uh, that's what I got, folks. Comments? Um, a broader comment later, but, uh, you know, one of the modern applications of the comment you made regarding uh, don't do the thing, you know, unseemly things happen at night. Uh, I think we can state in our culture what the same thing is um, when you are revealed, because that's what light does. Light reveals. And when you're anonymous online. Uh, and no one knows who you are, you see, like on Twitter and all this social media thing, you see some of the vilest, uh, wicked types of comments and behaviors and trollings and all of those types of things that uh, are now, now permeate our culture. It's because everyone is shrouded in uh, anonymity and secrecy, and there's no light to shine upon everything. And uh, light, the revealing is the best way to heal all things. And it's interesting watching our culture and our politics starting to be forcibly put uh, into a form of secrecy, uh, into uh, uh, anonym anonymity. I mean, they want to do away with uh, voting, I heard, because of the virus. They're going to do mail-in ballots. Yeah, that's going to go over real well. There's not going to be any fraud there, I'm sure. <clears throat> Pun intended. Sarcasm and sarcasm there. So. I uh, thought I'd add that to your comment about uh, when we do things during the daytime or versus nighttime. Okay. Thank you, sir. Other comments? Okay. Well, since no one else is speaking up, uh, I probably won't do it now. Maybe I'll do it another time, but uh, I, I came in late in regards to, um, you know, respecting the governing authorities that are put over us. You know, our, our nation at its inception and its foundation had that had this very argument that, that we're discussing um, and that you brought up in uh, in Romans 13 and and, and uh, here in uh, um, in other places and it's it's interesting the arguments that they had back then versus how we've become conditioned as a culture to put up with what um, our patriarchs would have actually literally picked up pitchforks and torches uh, against a long time ago. And it's because of, I think, a, a misapplication of how those verses uh, worked at our foundation. And I've had arguments with church people and, and their conclude, clu, sorry, conclusion is that we, were, we as a nation are in violation of Romans 13. And if that is the case, then I think then God has to do some serious repenting because we've been blessed above all other nations on earth 
in history um, as a result of that rebellion, uh, in in my uh, in my estimation. So I, I think in terms of uh, you know our founders and Jonathan Mayhew and others uh, that began arguing uh, the whole concept of, of fighting uh, what constitutes a tyranny that a Christian person should resist versus subjecting yourself to the governing authorities pretty much um, uh, was an argument over whether the governing authorities were ruling in the just uh, uh, stature of the Lord. And that their opinion was that once the king and parliament is no longer governing according to the laws of God, uh, you know, on the biblical moral law, then it has ceded its moral authority to govern and rule a free people. And that those sentiments and those arguments were made first in the churches, some ten to fifteen, to, uh, ten to fifteen years before uh, the uh, the Boston Massacre even took place. And so the the battle over whether or not we should be, we should be subject to um, governments of men was being fought in the pulpits long before we actually picked up uh, muskets and fired on the lawful legal authority of the Crown of England. And uh, as I mentioned to you in, in email. That argument also prevailed in the uh, in the Continental Congress. That that argument over whether or not, um, you know, we should uh, be independent from uh, Great Britain. Uh, that argument was was fought in the uh, you know in, in Congress with Adams and Jefferson and uh, Lee. They were all fighting against the Quakers that were uh, using Romans 13 as a reason that they shouldn't um, rebel against the Crown and they should acquiesce to every single request that the Crown made. And then that becomes, you know, a whole other discussion as far as applying those principles that went into our founding as opposed to what we put up with nowadays. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I am I'm think I'm rambling at this point because I'm not at my normal station. I'm trying to do two things at once. And as my wife always says, I can't because I'm a man. Huh. Ouch. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like your wife and my wife talk. Um, so... Um, yeah, interesting you bring up Adams. Uh, I, you know, that's you know, for me, that's what pops in my head is this. You know, brings up this point that our government, uh, the way that it's created, was was meant to uh, only for a moral and religious people, right? That is uh, wholly inadequate to the government of any other. There's this presupposition that what they've given us requires us to be Christians in some ways, requires us to be um, uh, charitable, to take care of some of the, um, the the poor and the downtrodden. There is this assumption that, that we will do that. And then I think what's happened over time is we have legislated morality and caused a, a blurring of the lines there um, and also kind of rendered uh, the church ineffectual in a lot of ways. I think the church has failed in, in a lot of ways um, to fulfill this need, um, and you know, there's maybe some 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 reason behind that. I don't know, but but I definitely see that this is kind of the way that it's slouched, um, and and this is now why we have what I feel to be um, the left, um, well, just enacting policy that makes them feel good as opposed to what's right and what's 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 good, <laughs> true. Um, anyways, I think that um, I, I, I did not, I, I, I think I remember that, that they were fighting against the Quakers on, on this, this blindly, you know, following the crown. Um, that's, that's fascinating, Michael. Yeah, if you look at the uh, diary writings of, of, of Adams, um, he was, you know, he was in a, in a personal war with uh, John Dickinson, who, mm -hmm used to go along with, um, you know, he's the one who kept uh, fostering these uh, olive branch petitions to the King and Parliament, that every time they wrote one, begging for relief from all of these new taxes and new tyrannies and impositions that it was met with, as Jefferson wrote, uh, greater injury. It, it came back even worse because they were complaining about the things that they were doing. And you mentioned that quote from Adams, as far as, as what we the people should be doing. Uh, when it said that uh, our government was only made for a, a, a moral and religious people, it's inadequate for the governance of any other. Earlier in that quote, uh, he mentions that the fact that government has no power or capability to contend with a people whose moral compasses are unbridled. 
He said, mm. because surely he was, they would just, you know, the avarice and ambitions of men would, would go through like a whale going through a net. He says, but our government w- w- must consist only in the context that a religious and moral people would safeguard it. And we haven't done that as a people because two things have happened. One, we left the running of everything to the professionals. And this yeah. is true in the church culture on mm-hmm. top of our political culture. We left the running of government to uh, uh, professional lawyers and the professional lobbyist cast. And those of us in the church have left the preaching of the gospel and, and running the church to uh, professional ministers. And mm-hmm. as a result, people in positions of power, their whole purpose is to maintain that power. And that means putting down the little people in order to continue to direct all of the influence and all of the funding and all and everything towards them. Because mm-hmm. mankind's nature is one to tell everyone else how they have to do things. You have to think this way. You have to do it this way. You have to pay your tax and do all. And we are existing under what um, uh, C.S. Lewis called, there's nothing worse than a living under a meddlesome tyranny. And that's what we've devolved ourselves into, you know. And, you know, you read the founders like Adams and you read Washington, you read the warnings they gave us. And we're guilty of not listening to both God, to scripture and the founders that lived through what, you know, they they were wanting us to avoid. So there's a lot of blame to go around. We can't just blame government. Government exists in its corrupt state because we let it the same way that the church got in its state because the lay people just want to, they don't want to be responsible. That's what it all boils down to. We don't want to be responsible. We want to leave it up to other people to tell us what to do, what to think and what to believe. And that is a sad consequence of what, this is why we're living under a tyranny because we're wholly ignorant of what we should know. I mean, I think the scripture says my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And then Hosea, was that four, six? Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh yeah, we're, we're ignorant and we've allowed other people to do our studying for us and tell us what to think and believe. And that's how meddlesome tyrannies happen. And then it becomes abrupt tyrannies shortly thereafter. You Sorry. should put together a sermon, man. That's, you know, you've really put put that. <laughs> I think you, you might have accurately diagnosed what, uh, what went wrong, as it were. Uh, well, one of my one of my my initial passions in life before God decided to throw me to the other side of the planet uh, to do mission work, which I had no intention of ever doing, was um, uh, our historical foundations. Because, you know, I went to high school in the 70s and 80s, and I discovered that my history teachers were wrong. Because I, you know, I don't like listening to what other people have to say about anything. I have to prove it for myself. So when I went back and looked at the, what the founders themselves wrote rather than what my history teacher was teaching me, um, I began to find a whole different type of history than what I was taught. Uh, and that caused me to really dig deep into our, our foundations and uh, started reading all everything I get my hands on as far as commentaries on our true history and, uh, and discovered some interesting things like, you know, going all the way back to Christopher Columbus about God's thumbprint and God's role in getting our nation established. And some of the things that happened are astounding and uh, miraculous and actually tie into some aspects of biblical prophecy as far as uh, my understanding goes. But I'm real passionate about the liberty thing, mainly because as our founders understood it, liberty is a gift of God or of Jesus Christ to his people, to the church, so that we can go and do his will unimpeded by the rule of men. Mm-hmm. That's the whole reason liberty existed to begin with in this country was so that we wouldn't have a pope or a king that acted like a pope telling us what we could preach, what we could not preach, so that the spirit of the Lord could actually motivate us and move us and direct us without the interference of men all the time. And uh, we were the only nation on earth, by the way, outside of the theocracy of ancient Israel that has been blessed with that provision. And we had the Holy Spirit uh, given to us after Pentecost and our founders and carried on through. And so everything our founders wrote, our patriarchs, put together was supposed to be carried on down by a vibrant church and a vibrant church would, would, would safeguard liberty with their, with, with, with their very being because that liberty is what empowers and enables us to go and do the work of Matthew 28, uh, 19 and 20. 
And when yeah. we see that authority to men in positions of power and authority, we lose that liberty and then restrictions are put in place. And we're told what we can preach, what we can't preach. Only these people can do the preaching. You can't go there. And then you get what we have now where the government can tell us, well, you have to accept homosexuality. You can't preach it, it that it's a sin and all this other garbage that's going on. And it's our fault. It's not just the government's fault. It's not the Democrats' fault. It's not the left. That human nature is human nature. It's going to do what it's going to do. But uh, anyway, this is, as you could tell, it's a passionate thing of mine. And uh, I need to get off the soapbox, or I'll just keep rambling. <laughs> I don't need to do that. Yeah, I hear you, man. Michael, I think you could probably tell us the first words to the Constitution. <laughs> us, the people? We, the people of the United States, to form a more perfect union, and on from there. Yep, and I'm also a big fan of the Declaration, because without it, you wouldn't have the Constitution. They go hand in hand. They do, and it's interesting yes. to hear how people say that, well, the Constitution is the law of the land, and the Declaration of Independence is not. Uh, that's a false premise, because without the Constitution, yes. You don't have the foundation for a free society. You don't. That's right. That's right. And people have forgotten who the government is. We are the government. Right. Which gets back to the point where a people that are no longer governed by God are going to be ruled by the tyranny of men. And that's, that's one of right. my favorite things that uh, I paraphrased from one of the, I think it was John Carroll, that one of the founders that wrote that. Yeah, and one of them. Not, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Rod. It was Johnny. Oh, it was Johnny. I'm sorry. I can't. I'm on my phone, so I don't get to see who's talking and who's not, unfortunately. I'm true. <laughs> Go ahead, Johnny. I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll sit down one day at the feast, maybe, and have a good discussion about this. Or sooner, depending on whether Skip wants a break from uh, doing the arduous task of preparing another Bible study. I'd be happy to talk about I've given a seminar once at one of the CEM uh, gatherings. I, don't remember, I think it was at the feast one year and then at the Paris Landing Retreat on God's role in our in our founding. And what I was stunned by, well, I shouldn't have been stunned by, but I, I kind of was, was um, how how many people that were there never really knew what I was presenting in terms of God's involvement in our foundations going all the way back, uh, you know, to Columbus. And uh, which I marvel at within the Church of God, because it's interesting is that we can tear the scriptures apart and we can go into the our lexicons and our, our, our Greek, uh, uh, you know, uh, language books and, and uh, our strong concordances to get at the deep root meanings of what each word means. But somewhere along the line, uh, we, all, we, we don't apply those same skills to our history and our foundations. It, it's kind of baffling to me, but it is what it is. Your history, gonna, history, your history is not taught in schools anymore at all. And yeah. uh, if, if, if you lose history, then you lose your nation, you lose everything. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And what I and, find baffling is a people that in the church of God that, uh, you know, um, have lost that I mean that had a loss, but they, they, they go into the source material, they go to the book to get to the truth of everything, but they can't apply those same skills to our history. I don't understand the disconnect. Yeah. It's, it's a I, weird I, thing. I, I've become to believe more and more that, that uh, God has given us the instructions on how to live and, and says, now go live your life. And uh, in this country, the same thing the the constitution gives us instructions on what to do and now go live your life and i have become more of a libertarian i feel like that i can do whatever i want to as long as i do not bring harm to anyone else yeah says, good, right <laughs> just go do good you'll be fine yeah and that's great except that you have a majority of the population no longer shares the same morality that once forged us you know you yeah. have more than 50 percent of the people in this country that want homosexual marriage and and uh, all the other you know 27 genders or 86 or whatever it is 
well, you see, or, yeah, yeah, that 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 is. If if I start practicing homosexuality, then I am going to harm someone else. Yeah, exactly. Not only that, eternally, because that's those that practice that are not going to enter the kingdom of God. That's right. So that's it's right. literally a matter of life and death. And if we love our neighbors, then we need to try to save them from the course they're heading on. That's the problem right. is you're going to get a lot of hatred for it. Yeah. I'm going to share with you, uh, Michael, this year at the feast, uh, my dad painstakingly put together a very large document tracing back all of our current uh, government practices from the judicial system, uh, everything back to scripture in the Old Testament um, and, and, and lays down the, the thread, if you will, of how, it, how, it, how it's manifested itself to today's you know, realization. It's a, it's, a, it's a big old binder full of, uh, I eventually, hopefully one day want to um, maybe kind of rework it and publish it. I think it's a fascinating uh, subject matter, like you were just saying, that a lot of people are, are kind of ignorant of uh, where this all came from. God, God set it all up and, uh, many, many years ago. And, uh, our, our founders knew that uh, the government that governs least governs best. And, and hopefully that's, uh, <laughs> that's not what we have now, for sure. Yeah, no, that's true. You know, that, that was uh, the government um, that, that we have was, was dependent on, well, it was kind of based on English common law, but our founders, again, come from a background of, of a Puritan background. And if you look at what the Puritans established from the Mayflower on, I mean, they were trying to establish an, uh, a colony and a nation that was not apostate from the word of God. And they wanted to have that uh, intrinsic character in the people that lived here. Uh, but, you know, they also understood that liberty means you can't force everybody to have the same exact belief system that you have. Um, and, of course, mankind's nature is one that, that never wants to put up with it. But they also understood that as a body politic, if we were not in agreement on what the moral foundations of the country were going to be, then we were going to have the same fate that befell Europe, which was going to be constant series of warfare over religious issues. You know, uh, this king uh, of Spain did this because he had the blessing of, you know, the Pope, and then the, the king of England did this, and because everyone had a different viewpoint of how uh, you know, the, the moral foundation should be in terms of waging war. And we're going into that because now we have different moralities that are governing the way the, 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 the country thinks. And we're divided. I don't know how many hundred fault lines that we're divided on, but it's huge. And you can't have a nation exist in this kind of atmosphere um, in a cohesive way uh, for very long when you have lawlessness also being posed by government. So it's just, it, it, it's nutty and absurd, but it's it, it breaks my heart is what it does because we're ignorant and, and uh, you look at what the founders said what they warned what they cautioned us to, to which was to christians they cautioned us to remain true to the, the scriptures and the biblical moral foundation or providence is how they they worded it um and we haven't done that and that's why we're in the mess for it yep i like it okay <laughs> <laughs> we got we got Michael wound up, didn't we? Uh, I told you, I warned you it would happen. I know, the one. <laughs> I I well, I you know I talked to you about it beforehand. I wanted you to to uh, feel free to to talk. Does anybody else have anything? Uh, uh, Michael and Blake cannot say another word. Does anybody else have any? Um, the only thing the only thing I have to say or, right now is or good night to everyone. <laughs> No, this was a this was a good uh, a, a good uh, discussion tonight. Next week we will uh, we'll we'll tackle Romans 14. I hadn't looked at it in a long time, so I don't really know what's in there yet. And then this Sabbath will be Sabbath number five, I believe. Is that not correct in our count? And I think uh, you do what. Yes, I think you are correct. Yeah, I think it's I think it's five, and uh, so it's only you know the rest of this week and two more weeks, and then Pentecost. So, uh, but anyway, this uh, this Sabbath we will be going through uh, Hebrews six, and uh, then we may take the week off. And well, not the week off, but.
have an open discussion the next week. Michael and I can talk about that. And, uh, yeah, maybe we can do the whole Romans 13 argument. There you go. There you go. Skip won't be there. He'll be magically gone. That's right. That's right. So, okay. All right. Well, good to talk to everybody. Hope you all had a, a good week or have a good week coming up. Uh, we're having this crazy weather where it's 60 degrees one day and 85 the next. But uh, yeah. I think we're ready for a little, a little warm weather, and then we'll start griping about that. <laughs> so, the truth. All right. Well, we will see you all next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Toodaloo.